Okay, so we got some numbers. Are they good or bad? The short answer, yes. Let's talk about it. So in the last video, we left off with this giant ducted fan hanging from the ceiling. So the next thing to do was to set up some instruments to get some accurate measurements. I started by using a laser level to transfer critical geometry to the wall. I then used these measurements to design an arm that could transfer the thrust of the fan on the scale. To make sure that I was getting accurate measurements, I set up a pulley in line with the center of the fan. Then I calibrated the scale by hanging one of my homemade lead weights to pull the fan from its center. Then I could move the scale back and forth slightly, which effectively adjusted the ratio of the levers until I got an accurate reading. My first attempt at this was kind of lame. I simply taped a thread to the nose cone and used a printed pulley from another project. It turned out that the printed pulley riding on the printed plastic had quite a bit of friction and introduced errors. So I made one with a bearing. Taping the thread worked well, but I ended up printing a new nose cone with a tiny hole in the middle that I ran a thread through. I wanted to be able to attach this calibration nose quickly, as I wanted to be able to verify accuracy of my measurements often during the test. Measuring the power consumption and airspeed was pretty straightforward, although I noticed I had to move the anemometer around to sample the air from the tail cone, as this number seemed to fluctuate significantly. I tried to be consistent with where I would measure from for the various tests. Getting an accurate reading of the RPM was a bit of a conundrum. I used this old hobby tachometer that I had and was delighted to see that the motor was turning at its rated speed of 3,450 RPM. Now, I'm no ear scientist, but it sure doesn't sound like that motor is getting to that high of an RPM. So I thought I had better verify. I filmed the motor with a high-speed camera at 240 frames a second, and then counted the frames per revolution on my computer. And guess what? Not 3,450 RPM. It turns out it was about 990 RPM. So what gives? It was at this point that I realized that the tachometer would read that no matter what. This is because it's simply reading the flicker of the lights in the shop, which are fed by 60 Hertz electricity the same frequency that makes this induction motor have a 3,600 no-load RPM. From this point on, I measured the RPM either using the high-speed camera or by shutting off the lights and opening the garage door to let sunlight in, and then the tachometer worked just fine. One thing I wanted to make was a ring so that the inlet would have a rounded profile. I wasn't sure how much this would affect the performance, but it was one of the things I wanted to experiment with. I knew it should allow the ducted fan to increase its thrust due to the Kawanda effect, but as you'll see, I was quite surprised at what an effect it had. I think now is a good time to talk about the design of the fan. I went with the that looks about right method to start with. Starting with the impeller, each blade is set to an angle of attack of 45 degrees at the hub. The twist in the blade is not arbitrary. It is set so the propeller pitch is constant the entire span of the blade. So for instance, on this ducted fan at the hub, the radius is 71 millimeters, which means that in one revolution, the blade profile at the hub will travel a distance of 449 millimeters. And since its angle of attack is 45 degrees, it will move forward 449 millimeters as well. This is the propeller's pitch. Now at the tip of the blade, the radius is 192 millimeters, which means for each revolution, the blade profile at the tip of the blade will travel a distance of 1,209 millimeters. To have the tip move the same amount forward as the hub, 449 millimeters, the angle has to be less. In this case, the angle needed to be 20 degrees or 25 degrees less than at the hub. And so that is how much twist is in the blade. Moving on to the tail cone. My thought was to simply have the exit profile to have the same area as the inlet profile, meaning I calculated the area of the fan and then made the exhaustlet the same area. So now to apply some physics and math to all of this. 
I'm most curious about thrust and speed and the power needed to produce this. I'm also looking to get just ballpark figures. I am well aware that there are extensive factors that you have to consider if you want to get extremely accurate numbers, but I'm trying to figure out the napkin math, if you will. And so for that, we turn to our good old buddy, Mr. Newton, and his second law. Force equals mass times acceleration. So in physics, it's important to think about the components that make up larger concepts. So for instance, the concept of velocity is made up of two smaller concepts, distance and time. You could move some distance, and depending on how fast you did it, we could calculate a velocity, like miles per hour, or feet per minute, or whatever unit you want. However, in physics, for all these formulas to work, you must use the international system of units. So for mass, you have to use kilograms, and velocity is measured in meters per second, and time measured in seconds. So to make this formula work, we need to tweak it a bit. Let's start with the easiest part, acceleration. So acceleration is simply measuring the change in velocity. For each second, how much does the velocity change? None. This ducted fan is stationary, and once the motor spools up, the RPMs are constant, what does change, however, is the mass. As the fan runs, it moves more and more air mass through it. So instead of calculating a change in velocity per second, we will need to calculate the change in mass per second. That leaves us with velocity to calculate. So remember, on this fan, the prop pitch is 449 millimeters. Putting that into SI units, this means that if the impeller was in air that did not let it slip at all, for each rotation, it would move forward 0.44885 meters. And since we measured its RPM off the high-speed camera at 990, this means each second it is rotating 16 and a half times. So, 0.44885 times 16.5, and we get a calculated velocity of 7.4 meters a second, or 16 and a half miles an hour for those of you that can't think that way. Figuring out the change in mass per second is a little more tricky. Let's start with the volume of air moved each second. Volume is length times width times height, or an area times a length. So in this case, the area can be calculated by subtracting the hub area from the entire fan area. So using pi r squared and the two radius, we get an area of 0 0.100308 meters squared. And as for the length, we already figured out that we are moving air at 7.4 meters a second. So when we multiply that, we get a volume of 0.74228 cubic meters each second. Now, what is the mass of air by volume? This is where things get a little tricky because it changes all the time. If I was doing this test at sea level, on a day when the barometric pressure was 29.92 inches of mercury and the air was perfectly dry and the temperature was 59 degrees Fahrenheit, well then the air would have a mass of 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. And that number is good enough for me. I live at about 500 feet elevation and again, I'm looking for napkin math. There are calculators that can figure out the exact mass with all those variables. So for instance, as of right now for me, here is the atmosphere I'm experiencing. Punch those numbers in at engineersedge.com and I see that the actual mass at this moment is 1.173 kilograms per cubic meter. It's not significant enough for me to worry about for my rough calculations. But if I lived up in the mountains in a high elevation, I most definitely would need to consider that. But back to calculating the mass per second. So we know the volume of air, 0.74228 cubic meters per second, times that by the mass of air, 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter, and we get our change in mass per second, which is 0.9 kilograms each second. And there it is, the two pieces of the puzzle. So the change in mass per second times the velocity gives us 6.4 kilogram meters per second squared, better known as Newtons.
which converts to approximately 652 grams of thrust. So those seem like reasonable numbers. And I was really excited to see the real world numbers reflect what I had calculated. So far so good. But then I calculated the power. This should be an easy calculation. So if we apply a force to some mass and move it a distance, then we have done work. Work equals force times distance. How fast or slow this change or movement happens would describe the power. Power equals force times velocity. The force, 6.4 newtons. The velocity, 7.4 meters a second, which gives us 47 watts. That motor was drawing 515. So I puzzled over this for a few days. At first I thought I was misapplying the physics and math. I mean, I knew there'd be energy loss, but that seemed really excessive. Where was the other 468 watts going? But then I realized I was way overloading the motor. It's an induction motor, rated for 3,450 RPM. With that big fan, it was only getting to 990 RPM. So it was never able to get past its startup phase, which draws a lot of power. It was at this point that I realized I should not have designed the fan so willy-nilly using that looks about right as my guide. In fact, if the motor was able to turn at its rated speed with that fan, and you do all the same math that we just did, it turns out it would make a theoretical 82 newtons of thrust at 26 meters a second, and would require 2,128 watts of energy to do so. That's a three horsepower motor. Tall order for this half horsepower X grinder motor. So it was back to the drawing board, or rather, starting at the drawing board this time. This time I worked backwards. A half horsepower is 373 watts. I thought I'd back it off a little, so I designed a fan with a theoretical 360 watts. So working backwards from there, I calculated that a fan with a .2488 meter pitch at 3,450 RPM should have a velocity of 14.3 meters a second and generate 25 newtons of thrust. So I made it. While it definitely performed better, I was still way overloading the motor. Now the thrust had doubled, but the motor was still not spooling up close to its rated RPM. I also noticed some other strange things happening. I wouldn't have been alarmed if the fan was performing less than projected, but it was actually performing better than the theoretical numbers, so clearly I missed something. I started by trying to make the model as simple as possible so as not to introduce too many variables. I measured the performance again, taking the tail cone off, and then again taking the inlet profile off. This was probably the most surprising to me. As we will discuss a little later, the inlet profile had a huge impact on the performance. In my test, it increased the thrust by 12 to 14%. Even with the model simplified to no inlet profile and no tail cone, it was still outperforming the calculations. So for instance, applying the math the same way we just did on the previous example, based off the measured 2000 RPM, I expected to see 8.4 newtons of thrust at 8.3 meters a second, but was measuring about 9.8 newtons of thrust at 8.3 meters a second. After double checking all my calibration and measurements, I was sure that I was missing an important factor in my model. There is no free lunch in physics, as they say. I decided to try modeling it using the entire area of the fan for calculating the volume. It is kind of ridiculous to imagine this shaft of air in front of the nose cone that sits there stationary. So if you model the problem as the volume of air simply moving around the motor, then for a given velocity, there would be a greater change in mass than in my previous model, where the volume of air was modeled after a donut. Doing all the same math as before, but using the entire fan area for calculating the volume of air, we get an expected 9.8 newtons of thrust at 8.3 meters a second at the measured 2000 RPM, which is exactly what I measured. So that still felt a little fishy, as I would expect to get slightly less than what the math predicts, but I applied this math model to quite a few tests after, and it seemed to work quite well. In fact, in total, I tried nine different fans, varying from nine blades down to two, at three different pitches, 
and two different aspect ratios. As long as there's no tail cone, no inlet profile, this math model gets in the ballpark quite well. The biggest surprise to me was what a huge impact the inlet profile had on the performance. I saw on average a 13% increase in thrust. At first, I thought this might be solely because of the Kawanda effect. Basically, the air moving into the inlet over this curved surface is causing a low pressure zone, which is causing some thrust increase. And it might be a factor, but something else that I'm finding strange is the increased velocity. I'm measuring velocities 7 to 11% faster than what my math model predicts. This makes me suspect other factors besides the Kwanda effect. I think a better description of what's happening is that the curved inlet allows the fan to draw in a greater volume of air. Meaning, when calculating the area for the volume, the curved inlet allows this area to be effectively larger. So, to have the same volume of air exit the fan through a smaller area, the velocity will increase. Although calculating the thrust and velocity based on the RPMs of the motor is useful, I was really more interested in the power required to produce this performance. I knew all the configurations where I am overloading the motor would be very inefficient and use a lot more power than needed. But I did end up with four configurations that all had similar performance, but at different power consumptions. These, not surprisingly, were the three-bladed and two-bladed props. I was originally worried that only having two blades would mean my math model wouldn't work. I thought, if there are only two blades, can I really use the entire blade area to calculate the volume? I thought there would be air slippage. And there was, but not a significant amount to my surprise. At least at these speeds and RPMs. So here are my best results. So using my favorite configuration, the three-bladed high aspect ratio fan as an example, how much power did it take? Well, at 19 newtons of thrust and a velocity of 11.7 meters a second, the power required is 223 watts. I measured it at 360 watts. So where is that other 136 watts of energy going? Well, early on, I tested the motor under no load. I measured it rotating at 3,500 RPM, and it had a power consumption of 95 watts. I don't know if it's 100% fair to deduct all of that, because no matter what configuration I put it under, it never reached this rated RPM. Cheap harbor freight. But if we do, then that only leaves 41 watts unaccounted for. This would make the fan about 84% efficient. So to sum up, will applying Newton's second law and the formula power equals force times velocity in this oversimplified way to inductive fan, will it get you in the ballpark? You know, will it allow you to do some napkin math? Kinda? If the ballpark is big, it'll get you in the ballpark. Of course, to be sure, I should test it out with a couple other motors and designs to verify, which I might do. In the meantime, I want to do some more experiments with different inlets and exhaust cones, but I'll save that for next time.